everybody. Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And thank you for joining us here for this webinar dedicated to the topic of transcatheter mitral valve in valve intervention. This broadcast is supported by the PCR webinars, webinars program and generously supported by Edwards Life Sciences. My name is Bernard Prendergast, an interventional cardiologist based in London, and it's my great pleasure to be with you this afternoon uh, co-hosting this webinar. So surgical heart valves have a long and distinguished history and have benefited the lives of hundreds of thousands of patients across the world over the last three or four decades. Indeed, in the recent years, we've seen transition from mechanical valves, increasingly moving towards biological valves in younger and younger patients as a result of advances in valve design and engineering technology. This progression has also been driven by patient preference in an attempt to avoid the need for anticoagulant treatment and the risk of bleeding complications. However, we recognize that there are nothing, there's nothing perfect in life and there are new major mechanisms whereby valves may fail over time, causing stenosis either as a result of panus, thrombus or calcification or valvular regurgitation as a result of wear and tear of the biological components of the device or as a result of infection in the deadly condition of prosthetic valve endocarditis. At the recent PCR Val Z course, we saw emerging data from the mitral registry led by Mayor Guerrero and colleagues at the Mayo Clinic, examining the role of the Sapien XT and the Sapien 3 valve treating the constellation of conditions, mitral valve in valve, mitral valve in ring, and mitral valve in mitral annular calcification. And this registry has demonstrated a two-year follow-up in summary that mitral valve in valve now has good argument to be the standard of care for all patients with favorable anatomy, that mitral valve in ring is certainly a very reasonable alternative for carefully selected high-risk patients, and that perhaps surprisingly, valve in MAC procedures are associated with increasingly positive outcomes, which seem to match the very early experience in TAVI, and indeed may well become a very reasonable alternative to redo surgery for high-risk patients. We should also recognize that the uh, Edwards Sapien valve is now CE marked for valve in valve procedures, but valve in ring and valve in MAC procedures would be currently off label. So that is the recent scientific data. What we aim to achieve in this webinar is a more practical approach, learning how these procedures can be performed most safely and most effectively. We will hear a brief overview of the evidence and clinical experience globally to date from Axel Unbehan from Berlin in Germany. And that will be followed by two case illustrations from Sergio Berti in Italy and from my colleague Simon Redwood in London. The first, what you might call a routine uh, procedure from Sergio with all the procedural tips and tricks in terms of the planning and the execution of the procedure. And secondly, a more challenging anatomical case presented by Simon that we recently undertook in preparation for the PCR Valsi course. We then hope for time for extensive panel discussion, and that will be driven by your questions, and we encourage you to submit those through the chat facility. And then I'll provide a wrap up with some key take home messages for us all. So without further ado, I think we need to move on. Our four presenters are here before you, all experts in their field and highly experienced interventional cardiologists. And our first presentation will be from Axel in Berlin. Axel. Yeah, no, 
Thank you so much. It's my privilege to take over the surgical part of the HART team. And it's, of course, a, a honor to be together with um, you and uh, excellent uh, cardiologists. Um, when we look on the current uh, registry data, it, next slide, please, it becomes clear that during the past decade, and this is already had already been shown by Bernard, that the number of uh, bioprosthetic valve implantations are still uh, going up uh, based on uh, especially patients' uh, preference. And uh, taking this into consideration, we have to expect that in the future, um, some of these patients will definitely come back and need another uh, valve procedure. If we implant today in a 70-year-old uh, patient uh, bioprosthesis, you have to expect that uh, about half of the survivors will come back 15 years after the procedure um, at the age of 85 and will have uh, another um, redo procedure. Mm. In current meta-analysis data, there's some difference between porcine valve and uh, bovine uh, pericardial valves, uh, but uh, um, overall uh, type of prosthesis, long-term results are pretty good for the surgical um, bioprosthesis. Now, if the valve is uh, degenerated, next slide, please. Um, then uh, what about the risk in, uh, of doing a redo procedure? These are the uh, results of a center of excellence from the Cleveland Clinic and an isolated redo mitral valve replacement uh, is associated with low um, in-hospital mortality rate below 1%. So this is outstanding. However, if we look on patients in a decompensated state, uh, patients who need uh, concomitant procedures like uh, coronary artery bypass grafting or with more complex anatomies needing a longer run uh, of the uh, heart lung machine or intraoperative transfusions, then um, in hospital mortality rate uh, is um, about nine times higher and is above 7%. So these are uh, high risk patients. Next slide, please. And uh, furthermore, if the patient comes back for a redo or re redo a procedure, uh, the surgical risk is even much higher. So uh, associated uh, with the initial uh, success of TAVI technology, early the question came up, why not to use TAVI technology also in the mitral valve? This is uh, from the Leipzig group, my colleague, Jörg Kempfert, the early stage of his career doing animal studies and the sheep, um, they use the transatrial uh, um, access to implant uh, sapien prosthesis with promising early results. Several groups um, tested it uh, as an off-label strategy in selected high-risk patients and uh, showed feasibility of valve-involved procedures using the transapical access. When we compare surgical redo um, uh, surgery with valve-involved procedures, uh, there's no randomized data available yet. But uh, if we, uh, we have several studies and comparing the patients, we see a much higher risk profile in the transcatheter group in all three studies shown here. However, if we look on one-year mortality rate, it's pretty much the same. So although there's a significant higher uh, surgical risk a profile in the transcatheter group is pretty much the same uh, regarding survival. And the patients have a, a shorter length of stay in the hospital, a longer, a shorter stay on the ICU, and shorter procedural times. So, uh, and especially for patients with poor ejection fraction, previous bypass surgery, severe pulmonary hypertension, the benefit is even better um, with the transcatheter uh, strategy. When we come from a uh, transcatheter valve and valve in the aortic uh, to uh, valve and valve in the mitral, uh, it's pretty clear that there's a different story. Uh, valve and valve in the mitral is much more complex. Situation is different, and there are other um, anatomical risk factors that needs to be considered. And furthermore, uh, there's a learning curve that uh, has to be expected. Early experience is different from late experience, and uh, with uh, growing um, experience, numbers of stroke, mortality, uh, missing device success are going down, of course. 
And furthermore, one has to expect that the sophisticated strategy planning is mandatory uh, for these transcatheter procedures. Uh, we have uh, different tools like the three Mangio tool, and we have this fantastic Laufen Bauf app um, to know all characteristics of a bioprosthesis. It's pretty uh, um, evident that uh, we need to make sure that there is no uh, obstruction of the left uh, outflow, left ventricular outflow tract after placing the valve. And this can be simulated with uh, different tools. Uh, from legacy data, we know that uh, residual new LVOT of at least 8.7 squared centimeter uh, should be left to avoid a significant uh, uh, tur turbulent flow in the left ventricular outflow tract. There are more fancy tools available, uh, like the Mimix Enlight. This is a tool that uh, generates uh, a true 3D model based on CT uh, data sets. And then um, you can dissect the model, you can uh, implant uh, several uh, mock up uh, and evaluate uh, the environment of the device landing zone. Here it's shown in Hancock uh, 31 uh, degenerated bioprosthesis where we decided to go for a Sapien 3 29 millimeter bioprosthesis. One may evaluate the residual new LVOT that is calculated to be about 1.9 squared centimeters, assuming that the leaflets of the Hancock prosthesis is fully covering um, the outer part of the stent of the sapien prosthesis. And what we, um, uh, what we uh, have seen in the pre-procedural planning is confirmed in the post-procedural results or so no significant uh, gradient in the LVOT. There are some types of bioprosthesis that are not good targets for valve and valve procedures because they are invisible in the fluoro. It's lab core shell eye or biointegral uh, bioprosthesis often used in uh, endocarditis cases. So lab core 27 um, degenerated bioprosthesis where we decided to go for Sapien 326. And here we use the uh, fusion imaging in the echo navigator to identify precisely where we want to place our transcatheter valve. This is mandatory to avoid any uh, displacement. Uh, looking at the lessons we have learned uh, from the device options, there's the Sapien platform, the one and only we have available, um, makes sense for transapical and transeptal um, approaches. We have learned uh, that uh, the precise implantation strategy is mandatory to achieve device success. We aim for oversizing and conical deployment to avoid migration towards the left atrium. We should know our target characteristics and we should aim for deep left ventricular implantation of the transcatheter valve to avoid transstent leak. We have uh, <clears throat> available different types of access to the transeptal and the transapical one. Uh, here are the results uh, that have been shown at the TCT last year um, from the uh, TVT registry comparing uh, transeptal and transapical um, approach. And of course, in the less invasive transeptal approach uh, observed to expected uh, mortality rate uh, is even lower. But we will see about uh, transeptal um, approach uh, much more in the next presentations. Pro and cons of the transapical access. Uh, transapical access is an easy access. It allows a precise positioning that's uh, potentially beneficial in invisible targets. It's independent of previous surgery on the intraarterial septum, but of course it's still uh, more invasive. It's a mini thoracotomy necessary intubation is mandatory and the results of course are highly dependent on center experience. Um, I quickly go through a transapical case, straightforward one, 57-year-old uh, patient with congenital uh, heart disease. Patient underwent several times mitral valve replacement and other cardiac procedures. Um, the arithmetic risk profile does not really reflect a true surgical risk. Degenerated perimount 31 bioprosthesis with high-grade stenosis, moderate regurgitation through the um, prosthesis, left uh, at, uh, apex, is displaced to the left based on right ventricular enlargement. 
And uh, what we did is mini thoracotomy, non rib spreading technique, just a soft tissue retractor in place. We avoid uh, um, extended dissection of the pericardium. We just do a, a small incision, place the uh, sutures uh, through the pericardium, and then do a, a slow inflation um, of the balloon. And uh, we have the possibility to correct the final position very precisely. Here we use the transapical uh, sapien system, uh, of course. Then uh, the sheath and the catheter and the wire are withdrawn, are uh, not uh, necessary anymore. And the uh, 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 sutures are tightened, and uh, that's it. Here we ended up with good result uh, laminar flow through the prosthesis and no um, transdent leak. Next slide, please. Coming to the conclusion, valve and valve uh, procedure or redo surgery, we have no randomized data available yet, but we see similar outcome despite much higher risk profile in the transcatheter patients, indicating that this is a, a good alternative uh, to redo surgery. Mitral valve and valve is more challenging than aortic valve and valve procedures. There are specific le lessons that needs to be learned. Imaging, of course, is key. Transeptal axis is less invasive, but we should not uh, forget about the transapical axis. Thank you so much. Um, now it's my privilege um, to hand over to Sergio, and I'm um, really looking forward to see some educational uh, aspects of transeptal uh, valve and valve procedures. Thank you so much. So thanks so much, Axel. That was an excellent overview of the clinical, practical planning and procedural steps involved in achieving success in these often challenging procedures. And it's particularly valuable to hear a presentation from a surgical perspective. So thank you for providing that a key and important information. We're now going to turn to some real world case examples beyond the short snip snapshots that Axel was able to provide in his overview talk. And the first of those is going to come from Sergio Berti from Massa in Italy, walking us through the key steps of a transcatheter mitral valve in valve procedure. Sergio. Hey, thank you, uh, Bernard, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I introduce uh, this uh, um, uh, patient is an uh, eight, seven year old man uh, with the systemic hypertension, dyslipidemia. Uh, he was submitted to uh, primary, primary uh, PCI in 2010. And in the, at the end of the same year, he was an, um, admitted for a severe metal regurgitation and uh, he underwent a mitral valve replacement with a Carpentier Edwards 31. In the same admission, uh, the patient was implanted with a dual chamber pacemaker for an AV block. At the end of 2019, uh, during an outpatient evaluation, the patient uh, at the echo showed the mitral bioprosthesis dysfunction. And uh, at the, in the August of uh, 2020, he was admitted in my department for uh, onset uh, effort of breathlessness. Uh, and uh, uh, for uh, to evaluate the um, what to do about the uh, bioprosthesis and uh, uh, more detail uh, on the previous uh, my uh, mitral valve replacement uh, it was done in uh, right anterior mini thoracotomy uh, left uh, longitudinal atriotomy this is a very important step because the uh, septum was not manipulated in addition he did the tricuspid anuloplasty uh, this is the uh, trans thoracic echocardiography that showed the severe a mitral regurgitation, severe stenosis with the gradient more than 15 and mild left ventricle dysfunction. The uh, transesophageal echocardiography confirm uh, these findings, and uh, uh, the 3D transesophageal echocardiography show the hypermobility of the leaflets, and the same imaging interrogated with a uh, color doppler show the severe uh, central regurgitation. Uh, 
this is the list of the medication and this is the profile of risk of the patient calculated with the STS score for their intervention. The risk of mortality is 0.5 point, 0.5 point. Um, and uh, the uh, patient was uh, evaluated the, by the heart team and uh, on the basis of the risk profile of the patient, on the basis of the uh, profile of uh, frailty of the patient and the age, we decided for a, a transeptal mitral valve valve implantation. Um, when we decide to uh, submit a patient to this procedure, we, have, we should have in our mind uh, clear some key points. Uh, first, uh, as mentioned before, we have to know clearly uh, the technical characteristic of the valve uh, where we have to implant the THV because we need of um, a, an appropriate sizing because you will see if in one hand we have uh, the risk of embolization, in the other hand we have the risk of uh, uh, gradient at the end of the procedure and the current positioning. And uh, uh, finally, to evaluate the risk of LVOT obstruction. To know the valve is extremely important because the technology of the valves is uh, different and uh, the uh, radiologic aspects is different. So we are to know exactly the valve that is implanted in our patient. Uh, this is the, these are the technical characteristics of the Carpentier 31. Uh, we see that the height of the valve is 20. And the true ID that is extremely important is 28.5. This valve is relatively easy to treat because the metallic frame and, uh, is uh, clearly visible at the floor. Uh, we want to get the result uh, to have an alignment of uh, uh, the um, same ring with the uh, skirt of the THP because the post doesn't offer any uh, chance for a good anchoring. So we have to anchor the, uh, the THV at the level of the, the uh, ring. Um, the uh, uh, CT scan confirmed the, the dimension of the valve 28 millimeter. And uh, if we see the uh, sizing chart, the 28, 28.5 diameter is uh, in the range of 29, uh, 29 sapient 3 uh, transcatheter heart valve. Um, we have to compare the technology of the two devices. Uh, the Carpentier Edward 31 is 8, 20 millimeters. The sapient 29 expanded is 22.5, but we know that the sapient 3 29 crimped is the uh, height uh, 31, uh, 31 millimeters. So we have to take into account during the placement of the valve that we will have a forest shortening of 8.5 millimeter. And this is extremely important for the precise placement. Uh, to evaluate the risk of LVO obstruction is uh, uh, very important. We have to take into account uh, a long list of anatomical characteristics. Uh, the distance of the prosthetic post from uh, the interventricular septum, the orthomitral angle that should be more than 110, and uh, the left ventricle anatomy, uh, the anatomy of the septum, uh, the, possible, the presence of a hypertrophy of the left ventricle of the septum, and very, very important, the neo lvot area that should be more than uh, two square centimeters. Um, this slide lists uh, the, uh, each single step of the procedure. First, we have to get the main venous femoral assess for the e sheet. Uh, we suggest to use the right because the right side is uh, more favorable for the uh, transeptal puncture. The second venous femoral assess for the pacemaker from the left side, so you have not interference with the catheter. And an additional uh, arterial assess or radial or femoral on the basis of the, of the um, physician preferences for a, a big tail or a possible bailout. We do the transeptal puncture uh, on the, following the uh, Ross and Brockenbrock technique. We give the heparin. Then we crossing the uh, bipolar using an agilis, a deflectable catheter. 
with the help of a pigtail and the standard wire. And we place two pre-shaped stiff Y in the left ventricle. In this case, we use the Safari extra small. Um, and we advanced the sheet in the femoral vein in one of the two stiff wires. The second wire is kept like a uh, body wire uh, to facilitate the advancement of the system. Uh, we do a balloon natural septostomy using uh, a 12 diameter uh, balloon and then commander essential, valve alignment and tracking through the septum and uh, uh, mitral valve prosthesis. Then the sapient tree is deployed during rapid pacing, 120, 150. The role of the rapid pacing in this procedure is to keep still as possible the uh, bioprosthesis. Then we evaluate the nominavic and uh, uh, with the echo, and uh, finally we close the, the venous assess. Uh, just a few words about uh, the uh, optimal site for the transeptal puncture. We suggest uh, to do the transeptal puncture in the inferior posterior part of the fossa valis. The CT scan shows the, that this point uh, provides a good alignment of the catheter with the main axe of the bioprosthesis. And let's go in the cat lab. We do the uh, transeptal puncture under echo and floral guidance. Uh, the, we suggest to use the uh, bicaval and short axis in order to have a precise puncture in the inferior posterior part of the fossa valis. A wire is advanced, all the material is already on the table. We advance uh, the agilis and uh, uh, with the agilis and the help of the pigtail and the standard wire, we, uh, we uh, advance uh, the, in the left ventricle and we place two stiff wires as I told, uh, in this case, we use the, the uh, two safari extra small. Uh, we remove the agilis and we prepare, we prepare the e-sheet for the placement. Uh, the e-sheet is advanced in one of the two wires. The, hours, the other wire is kept besides the e-sheet and the role of the second wire is to facilitate the advancement and the alignment of the uh, of the agilis of the commander during the procedure. One of the problems that we can have during this step is that the length of the uh, e sheet is was not taught for the uh, inferior vena cava. That sometimes can is short, so you, you can take touch with the tip. Uh, the, 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 the septum, so we can take care. And we advance the 12 uh, diameter balloon and we inflate one time, two times, in order to have a good dilatation of the septum. Then with the balloon not completely inflated, uh, we advance the catheter and the balloon uh, through the septum in the left atrium. Uh, through the bioprosthesis up into the left ventricle. Uh, this maneuver uh, guarantee that uh, to evaluate that the um, um, wire is not trapped in the sotovalvular um, system. At this point, we have to prepare the THV uh, as usually. The main warning is that the ceiling skirt and flow of the THB must be oriented proximally toward the flex catheter. Consequently, the outflow end is oriented toward the distal tapered tip in respect of the blood flow direction. Uh, our sapient tree is ready. We are advancing uh, as usually, uh, utilizing uh, the wire in, inside the, um, the, um, edge, the sheet. Uh, nothing of different from the uh, uh, procedure for the aortic valve. Uh, we advance uh, carefully, keeping uh, under control the position of the wire. This is a very critical step uh, because you can have a prolapse of the wire in the left atrium and you can miss the ventricle. Uh, then we uh, remove uh, uh, the loader and uh, we align the valve as usually. If you have not room because the tip of the um, a sheet is too 
close the septum, you have to retrieve gently uh, the uh, sheet in order to gain room. Uh, this is the system and it's advancing. As you can see, the tip of the commander is basically at the level of the septum. The valve is uh, perfectly aligned. We advance uh, all the system and in this phase we suggest to keep uh, the E of Edwards of the uh, commander toward the table. You have to play with the, with the flex and with the catheter in order to find the good, uh, the better alignment with the septum. The second wire help us in this uh, maneuver. Uh, we advance gently through the septum, uh, the, the valve, and uh, uh, we advance it uh, up to the uh, level of the bioprosthesis. Uh, at this point, uh, we have to decide what is the best uh, position of the valve. Uh, this valve, this surgical valve, is relatively easy to treat because it's visible. Uh, I suggest to keep the central marker of the uh, THV three, four millimeters from distally towards the ventricle in respect of the ring. Uh, if you keep this position, the uh, tip of uh, the post and the distal edge of the uh, sapien are more or less aligned. And this is a good position because the uh, forest shortening will occur from the uh, left atrium to the left ventricle. Uh, next slide, please. OK, uh, we are uh, manipulating the catheter in order to find for the optimal alignment. Uh, it's not easy because the, it's not uh, easy to keep the uh, sapient tree coaxial to the bioprosthesis. We remove the second wire. Usually, I keep the second wire in the left atrium as bailout. Uh, we retrieve uh, the pusher that uh, we suggest to keep it uh, at the level of the third marker in order to improve the support uh, toward the system. Uh, we start uh, with a rapid pacing uh, and uh, we start uh, with the inflation very, very, very slow. Uh, with this uh, slow inflation, uh, usually we have a good alignment of the sapient tree with the uh, main axe of the uh, Carpentier Edwards. Uh, we inflate as usual. Uh, we keep the inflation for five seconds. We deflate and we remove uh, the commander from the left ventricle and from the, the second tree. We stop the pacing. And uh, while we are uh, retrieving the uh, commander, the echo provides uh, the first preliminary imaging, we can see a good uh, um, uh, mobilization of the leaflet. Uh, there is not uh, um, regurgitation. Uh, we have to take into account that we have a wire inside the valve. If everything is fine, if the hemodynamic is fine, we remove also the second wire and we complete our uh, echo evaluation. The echo uh, plays a uh, essential role in all the steps of the procedure. Uh, at this point, it's not mandatory, but we prefer to do also a... So can you go back? Uh, no. Um, just please don't touch the... the... OK, uh, after the inflation, uh, we at the end of the inflation, we... Um, after the removal of the of the of the catheter, we do an angiography. The final equivaluation uh, uh, guarantee uh, that the, the demonstrated that uh, there is not a gradient and uh, with an excellent um, hemodynamic result. Uh, my final uh, um, slide are the key learnings. Um, procedural success can be achieved by. Uh, a, a good understanding of the bioprosthesis. We have to know the technology, uh, size, fluoroscopy aspect, and the previous surgical procedure. We have to know if the uh, septum has been touched by the surgeon or not, uh, the anatomy of the patients, 
and we have to plan carefully the procedure, uh, define in our mind uh, step by step what we have to do, when to do, and how to do. Uh, evaluate identification, evaluation identification of a contraindication, a possible complication, uh, make an accurate sizing and the positioning of the valve, and uh, use all possible uh, source of imaging to uh, have all possible information, CT, scan, transesophageal, fluoro, but we have to, in our mind, clear the anatomy of the patient and the position of the valve, and use only COMARC approved device. And in my mind, uh, the uh, mm, success of the procedure, can I have the last, uh, the, mm, exact, thanks. Uh, the success of the mitral transeptal valve in valve procedure depends 50% on the planning and a good screening and 50% uh, from the good conduction of the procedure. Uh, thank you for the attention. So, th Sergio, thank you very much indeed for that very detailed and very informative review of uh, transcaster mitral valve in what you might call regular anatomy. Lots of takeaway messages for our uh, webinar participants. Thank you. We're now going to come to Simon, and this is a case that we treated together recently at St. Thomas's with much more challenging anatomy, as Simon is going to demonstrate. Over to you, Simon. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, as you say, this was uh, quite challenging anatomy. The, um, can I have my next slide, please? So this is a 73-year-old lady who, who actually first underwent a mitral valve repair in 2004 and then underwent mitral valve replacement in 2011 with a St. Jude Biocore Epic 25 millimeter valve. She then sadly suffered endocarditis in 2019 and that um, degenerated the valve and she had combined stenosis and regurgitation and presented to us as NYHA class three. Uh, next slide, please. And here you see a lab investigations are not particularly invest uh, interesting. Her, she's got normal renal function. She's got impaired lung function with FEV1, which is 47% of predicted. Uh, she's in atrial fibrillation with a normal hemoglobin. Next slide. And here you see on the still image, uh, one snapshot of the anatomy. Her left atrium was huge. It's just over 10 centimeters in diameter with a volume of greater than 700 mils. Next slide, please. And here you see combined stenosis and regurgitation of the valve. And an estimated valve area of 0 0.6 uh, centimeters squared. So quite severe stenosis. And this uh, is a, a video which Ronak Rajani, who's our structural imaging specialist, um, produced. I'm just going to let this play. It sort of talks through some of the uh, advanced imaging and advanced planning which needs to be done prior to these procedures. And you've seen some of this in the last two talks. But first of all, the echo images. You see the very distorted anatomy of the huge left atrium, um, really pressing and compressing the right atrium. So it was combined stenosis and regurgitation with a huge left atrial volume of greater than 700 mils and quite marked right atrial compression and a very thin septum. And here you see a 3D reconstruction with cinematic volume rendering demonstrating the huge left atrium and the very distorted anatomy and a small left ventricular cavity. And here, making the LA transparent, you get a better feel for the anatomy. And these are all very useful steps uh, in order to visualize the orientation of the valve in the procedural planning. And we also do a 3D print of the heart to demonstrate the anatomy as well. And here you'll see cardiac endoscopy going through the mitral valve replacement. Into the left ventricle. And then you saw this earlier, earlier with the materialized mimics and light 
uh, 3D planning. We first start with a functional data review. And then localize the mitral valve in three planes. And then perform automated segmentation. And then we select the type of case, which is a valve in valve in this case, segment the valve. and then select the landing zone along the sewing ring of the valve. And then we can simulate uh, positioning the valve inside and calculate what the Neo LVOT would be. So here you see positioning the valve um, in different positions and calculating the neo LVOT. And these are very useful steps to uh, reduce the risk of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, as you've heard earlier. And finally, this is also useful for planning the position of the transeptal, um, which in fact, in this case, uh, as I, when I showed the case, you'll see it was actually quite difficult to do to accurately position the transeptal um, because of the bowing of the left atrium into the right atrium, so the septal bowing. And it gives us a predicted deployment view. Finally, we've done finite element modeling using the FIOP system. And then um, virtual reality using the GE system, where we can move the house around in any position and take cuts through in any position to get a better feel for uh, the procedure and the planning of the procedure. So that's a snapshot of the procedural planning that goes behind these cases. And uh, if I could have the next slide, please. So we had a heart team discussion and uh, we felt that she would be better off being offered a transcatheter mitral valve in valve rather than a redo mitral valve replacement. Next slide. And the strategy was a femoral venous access with proglide preclosure. We were using a TOE guidance for the transeptal access. And although the valve in valve app was suggesting a 23 millimeter sapien, we felt that that would leave her with um, a, pa a patient prosthesis mismatch. So we decided to use a sapien 26 millimeter valve with 10% of the valve being above the fluoroscopic marker. And we would perform rapid pacing using the left ventricular wire. Next slide, please. So in summary, 20, 73 year old lady, degenerative 25 millimeter bioepic, Biocore epics and Jude mitral valve with severe left atrial dilatation and quite abnormal anatomy, um, but a low risk of neo LVOT obstruction. Next slide. So now I'll just briefly show you the procedure. The first transeptal, in fact, was unintentional. As soon as I brought the catheter up into the high right atrium, it fell across the septum, which was paper thin. And next slide, please. And you'll see this was too high a puncture. And although I could get into the left ventricle with a pigtail using an agilis, the uh, position was not very stable and not coaxial. And every time I pass a, a safari wire into the left ventricle, it all prolapsed back into the left atrium. Next slide, please. And so I performed a lower, more posterior puncture. And here you see an agilis across into the left atrium with a wire uh, and a pigtail into the left ventricle. Next slide. And now you see the wire has been removed and just the pigtail 
and keeping the agilis in that position towards the mitral valve aids bringing the, the um, uh, safari wire in. Next slide, please. And here you see the safari wire crossing the left atrium into the left ventricle. And I put a big secondary curve on that safari, which makes the procedure a lot easier to pass your um, sapient commander system into the prosthetic valve. Next slide, please. As you saw earlier, we perform an atrial septostomy, in this case, using a 14 millimeter balloon. Next slide. And here you see the uh, valve in position and just about to be deployed. So we do rapid pacing at 120 beats per minute. It's a slow control deployment, as you'll see. When I deploy the valve, I have one hand on the delivery system and the other hand on the wire so that I can ma manipulate the two separately. And if the valve looks like it's too deep, push on the wire rather than pulling on the delivery system because that will make it less coaxial. And as we near full deployment, you see I pull back on the delivery system to make it more coaxial as well. It's quite a nice demonstration of, um, of the techniques used to ensure the valve is actually deployed in the right position, uh, despite the fluoroscopic markers being virtually invisible. And the post-procedural gradient was very small. I think it was two, three millimeters of mercury with no regurgitation. And she made an uncomplicated recovery. Thank you very much. So fantastic, Simon, a, a very nice demonstration of, a, of what we might call advanced uh, skills required for this very challenging an anatomical situation. We've received a number of questions while you've all been presenting, and I've been doing my best to collate them into some kind of order as you've been uh, providing these excellent overview presentations. I think we should come back to you first of all, Axel. We, we've been talking here about balloon expandable valves. Uh, within surgical bioprostheses. And some of our audience are a bit worried about the risks of balloon expansion, particularly if there is calcification around the annulus. And also a specific question whether or not it would be safe to do this with vegetations, healed vegetations on the mitral valve leaflets. Can you offer some comments from a surgical perspective? Yeah, it's quite interesting. Doing valve and valve uh, in the mitral, the risk of stroke seems to be uh, pretty low. However, if um, I'm facing mobile uh, structures, uh, vegetations on the leaflets, I would think about uh, placing a cerebral protection system. So it's easy to, to use it and uh, maybe at least theoretically it will uh, prevent uh, stroke in these patients. Mm, I think calcium uh, or MAC uh, outside the ring of the bioprosthesis is no big problem for a valve and valve procedure because we don't touch it. But uh, of course, it's a risk factor for a redo surgery, and it's even more an indication to go for a transcatheter uh, strategy from my point uh, of view. Um, yeah, uh, what we have uh, seen in um, in Simon's case, it's of course uh, pre-existing uh, patient prosthesis mismatch. Uh, that's a ch <laughs> very challenging situation. Um, of course, it's off-label. Have you ever think about doing balloon valve fracture in these um, specific uh, cases? And if you do so or think about such a strategy, of course, it's even more an, uh, an indication for using cerebral protection. But um, my perspective, um, the risk of um, emboli to the brain is not as high as we w might be afraid of. Thanks, Axel. Those are very helpful comments, particularly in relation to the risk of embolism. But you, you raised the important question relating to valve fracturing. and. Simon, I know this was something that was going through your mind with this slightly undersized prosthesis for this patient. What's your understanding of the risks and the benefits of valve fracture in the mitral position? Well, yeah, I guess the first thing to say is I don't understand why they use such a small valve. I mean, the Biocore Epic 25 has a 21 millimeter ID, which really is very small for the mitral position. But I guess we're all learning a lot more about patient prosthesis mismatch or have done over the last 10 years or so. Um, with regards to valve fracture, in fact, we have never fractured a mitral valve. This is the first patient that we've seen with such a small valve. Uh, 
But there is one report from the Brigham and Women's of, of fracturing this exact valve in the mitral position. Um, but interestingly, they, they had used a 23 millimeter sapien. The patient came back a few months later with a high gradient and they tried to fracture it with a 24 millimeter balloon, failed to, so they went in with a 26 millimeter balloon. And although they fractured the valve, they destroyed the sapien, and so they had to deploy a second sapien 23. Um, so that's my only experience of fracturing mitral valves is that one case report. I mean, we were planning on fracturing it if there was a high gradient. In fact, we were lucky and there wasn't, but I probably wouldn't be quite as aggressive as 24 to 26 millimeters. I'd probably use a 23 millimeter balloon, just a couple of millimeters bigger than the ID and see how we go. And, and of course, as you mentioned, use cerebral protection. Sorry, Simon. So I'm, I'm going to come to Sergio in a minute for a few comments about sizing. But while, whilst we're with you, Simon, we tend to use the valve in valve app. And we've got very familiar with that over the years, particularly with aortic valve in valve procedures. But do you think we've got more scope to oversize in the mitral position and are aiming for this conical implantation? Is that where we need to go ultimately? I, I, I think so. And as you know, we are, we are much more comfortable using a 26 millimeter valve because if we did have to, if there was a high gradient, we would fracture it. We had the comfort of knowing we were a 26 millimeter valve in there rather than a 23. Um, but I do think we, we should routinely oversize and have a conical deployment because it, nothing more disastrous than embolizing the valve into the left atrium. So Sergio, you, you commented specifically in your presentation about the importance of knowing the, knowing the valve and also knowing the dimensions of the valve. And I think you emphasize that the internal diameter is the key measurement. C can you re-emphasize that and give us a little bit more information? Uh, yeah, the precise measurement uh, of the internal uh, diameter of the valve is uh, uh, mandatory because uh, if in one hand we have the risk of embolization, in the other hand we have uh, the risk to have a gradient at the end of the procedure. And this is in the, for the mitral valve is extremely, extremely uh, critical. Uh, usually I uh, um, collect all the technical information of the valve because uh, uh, the number of the valve uh, uh, doesn't is not the expression of the dimension of the valve. You have entered in detail in the technical um, characteristic of the valve. The true ID is the real uh, measure, measurement that uh, you need. But uh, I repeat uh, the uh, measurement with the CT scan. And this is one of the aspects because uh, uh, we uh, must be sure that uh, uh, we will select the appropriate uh, sapient tree. And this is one aspect. The second aspect is to evaluate uh, and know uh, the material of the bioprosthesis. If you have a metallic ring, the expansion of the bioprosthesis usually is slow. If uh, there is not a metallic ring, and for example, the, maybe Axel cannot um, uh, support me, the, the, the material could be just a little uh, flexible, so absorb a part of the expansion, for example, in Hancock. Uh, so uh, the sizing is the final evaluation of different aspects uh, regarding the technical characteristics of the valve. Uh, the precise measurement is one. But we have to take into account all the technology of the bioprosthesis because this is very, very critical. Because the, uh, the embolization of the, of the um, sapient in the uh, left atrium is a catastrophic event. So thank you, Sergio, for those very important messages. Uh, Axel, coming back to you, therefore, you, you implant surgical valves, so you have better understanding of them from the beginning than we have to achieve through imaging. So can you add any extra information that is helpful uh, for interventional cardiologists in relation to the valve design and the sizing and how we can use imaging uh, to help us beyond the messages from Sergio? Well, um, what we 
what is important to know is that the label size of um, surgical bioprosthesis is not a true information about internal diameters. Of course, um, perimount um, bioprosthesis that's pretty large internal diameter compared to the sewing ring. But uh, if we look on other valves such as the bio-integral or um, um, other um, devices with a huge uh, sewing ring, though the internal diameter is much smaller. So the valve and valve app is pretty helpful um, from my perspective. Um, another option is to do a balloon sizing if uh, the internal um, diameter or the characteristics of the bioprosthesis are unclear. Um, we did it in several cases. So one needs to make sure that you use a, a high pressure balloon. If you use a, um, a soft balloon, it may rupture and uh, you may have uh, may end up with problems to retrieve the balloon. But this should be taken into consideration. But I think uh, it's fundamental to know the characteristics of the bioprosthesis. Yeah, and perhaps sometimes it's uh, helpful if uh, it is an um, target with uh, where we have not much information. It's sometimes um, good to do an in vitro testing uh, beforehand. Um, yeah. Okay, that's very helpful. We, we've got a very detailed question which only you can answer, Axel. So I'm going to stay with you. But we haven't talked much about LVOT obstruction. And of course, imaging is essential to predict the likelihood of that happening. But one of our audience is a bit worried about the papillary muscles and whether the length of the papillary muscles might influence the risk of LVOT obstruction. Or in most cases, it's likely that the papillary muscles have been resected at the time of surgery. Can you help us with that one? Yeah, it's, uh, it's worth to have a look on the uh, report of the um, index uh, surgical procedure to make sure which technique had been used, what had been done uh, with the anterior mitral leaflet um, and, and so on. And this is uh, extremely helpful. On the other hand, when we use today for the CT scans, it tells us uh, pretty much the truth, what is uh, still in place and where we have to expect uh, that the um, residual um, cords and papillary muscles uh, will be displaced and all the simulation software tools are extremely helpful. But of course, it's important to, to have uh, a look on the surgical report. And uh, I think in a, in a good and uh, fair heart team, it makes sense perhaps to see some of uh, mitral valve procedures. And today in a minimally invasive mitral valve surgery, where you'll have a, three camera, a 3D camera inside the patient, and it's also extremely helpful to have a, a good understanding. Um, it's uh, true for the mitral and especially also for the tricuspid valve. Um, yeah, I think this is, um, this is helpful. But may I ask you a question from a surgical perspective? If there is some risk of LVOT obstruction, is there any interventional option to pre-treat the patient or any bailout strategy we do have available? Well, there is uh, embolism, alcohol septal ablation, for example. That's something that has been described in these procedures, either as a preparatory step or as a, an emergency bailout maneuver in the case of, um, of uh, LVOT obstruction. You can also do kissing uh, implants of a simultaneous tabby device in the aortic LVOT position and in, the, and in the mitral position. That, of course, would be very extreme, but it has been described in individual case reports. Perhaps that's the subject for our next webinar. Let's see. <laughs> so I now need to conclude. We've just got a few seconds left, but I hope the uh, presentations and the discussion has demonstrated that the number of pr patients presenting with these degenerating mitral bioprostheses is increasing that we have growing and accumulating experience around the world of these procedures, but that these are not straightforward and they should be undertaken in experienced high volume centers where clinical expertise, imaging assessment and pre-procedural planning are available and the very advanced interventional skill sets are available to allow the procedures to be performed safely and successfully.
So thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. I hope it's been educational for you. And goodbye from us all. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.